Hello and welcome to module three of our English Literature Foundation course. And in this module, we are focusing on how to read fiction. So, topic overview. We're first going to look at characterization, then move on to looking at themes, motifs, and symbols. And then we're going to look at narrative sequence and focalization, which is another word for point of view. And finally, we're going to look at mood, setting and atmosphere. So let's jump straight into topic one, characterization. What makes a character? Well, in fiction, a character is basically the imaginary representation of a personage, right? So it's basically a person, but a fictional or an imaginary one. So characters are essentially made up of external traits, such as actions, speech, and appearance. And of course, also their internal traits, such as their emotions, thoughts, and motives. And together, if we add external and internal traits, we get these three aspects of a character, which are personality, morals and values. So all characters are essentially made up of their personalities, their morals and values. And so in order for us to understand a character as a whole, we we'll need to break them apart according to the external and internal traits as outlined here. So let's now talk about the idea of flat versus round characters. In E.M. Forster's seminal study of fiction, Aspects of the Novel, published in 1927, Forster posits that all characters essentially fall into flat and round categories. So flat characters are those with little to no development or change throughout a novel or a story, whereas round characters are more complex because they develop and change throughout the course of a story. And because they embody such complexity and nuance, they more closely resemble real human beings like ourselves. A specific type of character is called stock character or archetypes. And these are characters with a set of distinctive traits that recur in literary representation. Because we find them in so many different literary works, it makes them easily recognizable to audiences. And a good classic example of a stock character is the miser. And we find that in Dickens' A Christmas Carol in the form of Scrooge. And equally, there's what we call stock situations. And these are basically plot lines that recur in literary representation, such as the love triangle, love at first sight, reaching some sort of epiphany at the dying bed, the mistaken identity like the one in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or the last minute rescue, etc. So Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet features two classic stock situations, the first being love at first sight and also the star-crossed lovers narrative. So remember, when we're analysing characters, we always want to be focusing on their motives and their transformation. So what motivates them to do certain things or say certain things? And also, how do they change throughout the course of a story? So here are just some examples of character transformations. In Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, Scrooge transforms from a heartless penny pincher into a charitable good Samaritan. And the transformative event are, of course, the ghost's visitations. In Lord of the Flies, Ralph, the protagonist, transforms from a naive, happy-go-lucky boarding school kid into a mature, pensive teenager through a process in which he loses his innocence from being involved in the power struggle with Jack, his arch nemesis, and also from witnessing his friends, Simon and Peggy's brutal murders. And in Jane Austen's famous Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Darcy transforms from being an arrogant, unempathetic man into a much more considerate and understanding character after Elizabeth Bennet rejects his marriage proposal. And finally, in Kate Chopin's The Awakening, the protagonist Edna Pontellier transforms from a demure stay-at-home wife into a much more liberated woman who pursues her passions even at the expense of her life. And the transformative event that she undergoes is her affair with Robert Lebrun. Mm -hmm. 
who is a man younger than her. Topic two, theme, motif, and symbol. So really when it comes to fiction, there's probably no story without there being also some sort of theme. And a theme is a broad idea explored in any given literary work. And these could be abstract ideas like love, jealousy, war, peace, etc. Or they could be more specific ideas like the humdrum nature of suburban existence or the inevitability of change in relationships, etc. So motif and symbol are essentially references that support themes or they shed light on themes. And motif is a reference in the form of an object or an idea which recurs throughout a literary work, whereas a symbol is a reference, usually a concrete one, like an object or a gesture, which represents the literary work's themes. And actually, we've covered this in our poetry module in terms of looking at how we can differentiate between a motif or a symbol. But we're just going to quickly recap there. And it's all about the frequency with which the reference appears, right? So if a reference appears multiple times throughout the text and carries symbolic significance that sheds light on themes, then it's a motif. But if it's symbolic but only appears just once or twice, then we would call that a symbol. So as you can see in the diagram on the right, a symbol is definitely something that sheds light on the theme, but compared to a motif, it would appear much less frequently. But with motifs, we tend to see them popping up throughout the narrative. So to go back to using Lord of the Flies, we can map out this relationship between theme, motif, and symbol. So in the story, one of the most important symbols, if not the most important symbol, is the Lord of the Flies, which is, of course, also the title of the novel. And the Lord of the Flies is a pig's head on a stick, which one of the characters, Simon, imagines to be physical manifestation of the devil speaking to him and tempting him into acts of evil relaying ideas about human evil and darkness. But what kind of manifests this sort of human evil is through the motif of murder and death, which we see recurring throughout the story. First with the accidental murder of an unnamed boy with a mulberry birthmark, and then followed by the murder of Simon, the murder of Piggy, and finally the attempted murder of Ralph by Jack and his tribe of hunters. And ultimately, all of these lead to the theme, loss of innocence. And so you see, this is how the symbol, motif and theme in any story would connect to one another. So topic three. Narrative sequence and focalization. So what's a narrative? A narrative is simply put a sequence of events recounted by a narrator and a narrator is someone who tells a story. Focalization is the point of view from which a narrative is recounted. So here are some common types of narrative sequence and focalization. So with narrative sequence, you have your classic linear narrative, which follows the story in its original chronology from the beginning to the end. And then you have flashback, which is also called analepsis, flash forward, prolepsis. And then you have something called in media res, which is basically a fancy Latin term for starting in the middle of something. And then you have other types of narratives like circular, parallel, cliffhanger, and twist ending, which I'll explain in the next slide. And then for narrative focalization, these are the main types. And you have the first person narrative, the omniscient narrator, limited omniscient narrator, unreliable narrator, intrusive narrator, and the interior monologue. You notice that from these narrative focalization types, they're all first and third person because second person point of view tends to be rather rare in literary fiction. We tend to find the second person point of view in nonfiction, for example, like self-help books or manuals or even recipes or something, cookbooks, but not quite as often in literary fiction, not even in epistolary meaning letter writing kind of fiction, because that's still kind of dominated by the first person point of view, even though there could be occasional references to you, which is the second person pronoun. Let's now take a look at some types and examples of narrative sequence. 
First, you have linear narrative, which follows the story's original chronology from the start to the end with no disruptions. George Orwell's 1984 is a good example of that, as we trace the journey of the protagonist Winston Smith being an employee working at the Ministry of Truth to gradually revolting against the state and suffering as a result. And then we have flashback sequence, which is when a past event is inserted into the normal chronology of the story. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is a good example of that, especially when we reach halfway through the story where the monster recounts on his past experiences being tortured and abused by humans that he had encountered in his journey. Then you have a flash forward which is when a future event is inserted into the normal chronology of the story. The Christmas Carol is a great example of this because when Scrooge is visited by the ghost of Christmas future, he's given a quick glimpse and a flash forward into what his life would look like in his old age if he were to continue being such a miserly penny pincher. And obviously it's not a pretty sight. And then in media's phrase, which is a narrative that begins with an event that happens midway through the normal chronology of the story. So it's literally just cuts right into a specific moment without any sort of setting or explanation of who the characters are. Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf is a good one because it literally just starts with a moment describing the protagonist Clarissa Dalloway's day as she goes about her morning buying flowers in London. They have a circular narrative. And the circular narrative is basically when the ending is the same as the story began. A good example of this is George Orwell's Animal Farm. So the novel begins with the animals being held captive. And then throughout the story, they try all sorts of ways to revolt against their captivity. But ultimately, ironically, they also end in the same sort of captivity. Except when at the start, they're held captive by Mr. Jones, the human farmer. And at the end, they're held captive by one of their fellow animals. And that's Napoleon the boar, but also in collaboration with humans. Then you have the parallel narrative. And that's basically the sort of story that features multiple plot lines. You've got a main plot and a subplot. And they interact to some extent, but they are um, in their own respect separate stories. So for example, with The Great Gatsby, the main plot is obviously Jay Gatsby and Daisy Buchanan's long lost love. But then you have the subplot of Nick Carraway, the narrator's relationship with Jordan Baker, who is a friend of Daisy's and his love interest at one point. And then next up, you have the cliffhanger. And so a cliffhanger is just as it sounds, which is um, a type of narrative device that leaves the plot hanging with an open ending. So we end the story feeling like we don't really have closure or asking ourselves, well, what next? What's going to happen next to this character or the situation? So there's lots of questions that remain and complexities that are unresolved. And so this sort of ambiguity is obviously for deliberate reasons, usually to get us thinking deeper about the ideas explored in the novel. And an example of this would be Golding's Lord of the Flies, because the novel basically ends with Ralph looking up at the naval officer with sad eyes, but we don't really know kind of what happens after this moment. We assume that Ralph and the boys will be taken back to civilization, but we don't really know kind of what happens after that or whether or not they reflect on this experience and how it affects them in their adulthood. And finally, you have the twist ending. That's the sort of story that concludes with this surprising, unexpected, or even anticlimactic event. Uh, and so given the nature of the twist ending, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but a classic example of this is Shirley Jackson's short story, The Lottery. And then with narrative focalization or point of view, you have the first person narration in which the storyteller appears as I, first person pronoun to relate the narrative and then you have the unreliable narrator which is a storyteller who relates the narrative in a way that's untrue biased distorted or misleading now unreliable narrators aren't liars sometimes they might just be misguided or usually they might be very young and so they might be unreliable not because they're deliberately prevaricating but rather because they're naive or that they're not understanding the full situation. And so a good example of this is The Catch in the Rye, which is a novel by J.D. Salinger, in which the narrator is basically an adolescent who doesn't really understand 
a lot of what's happening around him in the adult world. But of course, he's a teenager filled with angst and naivete. And so that's the sort of perspective that we're given. And then you have the interior monologue, which is a favorite narrative device for modernist authors. Again, Mrs. Stalloway by Virginia Woolf is an example here. And the interior monologue is sort of narrative representation of a character's inner thoughts, impressions, and memories. And so it's really, really diving deep into a character's mind and emotions, and even down to the granularities like their immediate impressions and senses. Then you have the intrusive narrator, which is a favourite with Victorian novelists who tend to be a little bit more moralising. It's a kind of omniscient narrator who interjects at certain points in the story with personal commentary on the characters or the narrative. And so George Eliot in Silas Mana does this quite a bit as she occasionally stands back and comments on the situation of her characters. Then you have the classic omniscient narrator, which is the third person or knowing narrator privy to what all the characters think and feel. So they know what all the characters think and feel. It's almost as if this narrator is a godlike figure. And then finally, you have the limited omniscient narrator. And so the limited omniscient narrator is a narrator who knows what one or just some characters think and feel. And a good example of this is James Joyce's The Dead. It's another short story, which I invite you to read. So now let's move on to the final topic, which is mood, setting and atmosphere. Now, mood is simply the way a text makes the reader feel. And then the setting is the time, place and or environment presented in a text. The atmosphere, then, is the way a specific setting or environment presented in the text makes the reader feel. So it's important that we understand mood to be the umbrella term. Under mood, you have atmosphere, because atmosphere is a specific type of mood. It's a type of mood that's only contributed to by a setting or an environment. That's why I think sometimes it can be helpful if we think about emotive words when we're trying to describe mood and atmosphere. Is the atmosphere happy or is the atmosphere sad? Is it perhaps chaotic or is it disturbing? These are all words that could double as descriptors for our emotions. For example, Lord of the Flies is the text, right? And so there's a certain mood that dominates this book. But in Lord of the Flies, there is a specific setting, and that is the island. And so if we take a look at this quick passage from the first chapter. It says, The shore was fledged with palm trees. These stood or leaned or reclined against the light, and their green feathers were a hundred feet up in the air. The ground beneath them was a bank covered with coarse grass, torn everywhere by the upheavals of fallen trees, scattered with decaying coconuts and palm saplings. Behind this was the darkness of the forest proper and the open space of the scar. So this is clearly a descriptive passage about the setting, right? And so how would you describe the atmosphere of it? The first thing that we should do is to pick out specific descriptions that um, perhaps belong to the same kind of idea, right? So coarse, fallen, upheavals, decaying, darkness. These are all words that convey a certain kind of eeriness, a certain kind of chaos, a certain kind of unruliness. And so perhaps we can use words like dark, eerie, foreboding, chaotic, disturbing, etc. to describe the atmosphere of this specific setting, according to this passage. And so that's it for this module, guys, as a quick primer on how we can begin to read fiction. Now we move on to our next and final module.